I'm going to read verses 12 to chapter 4, verse 1. You can find Philippians chapter 3, particularly the verses that we're going to read on page 1166, 1166. So it's the end of chapter 3. Familiar words and words that are fitting in light of what we're going to consider in Lord's Day 52 in question and answer 127. which is the last petition of the Lord's Prayer. But before we read these words, let's ask the Lord for a blessing. Shall we pray? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, before us now lies the wealth of your grace, the wonder of your love. On these pages, Lord, is stored the pearl of great price, the treasure found in the field, the wonder of your love for us. Lord, may we now have eyes to see and ears to hear. May we have hearts to believe, and may we have mouths to rejoice in all your grace and goodness towards us in Jesus Christ, even as we hear your word proclaimed. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians 3, then, beginning at verse 12, reading to verse 1 of chapter 4. Hear the word of God. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and, their glo and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm to thus in the Lord, my beloved. As for the reading of God's holy word, let's turn to Lord's Day 52 then, page 257 in the Forms and Prayers books, page 896 in the Trinity. It's question answer 127 that we'll recite the answer to this morning. And Lord willing, conclude our study of the Catechism in our next study of Lord's Day 52. But today we'll just deal with 127, the last petition, the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And we are asked in this petition then, or in this rather question, and answer this question, what does the sixth petition mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil means. We are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment, and our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. This the church does believe. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we've been experiencing lately the change of the seasons and the fall weather. The other day we had no shortage of wind. And as long as you were inside, maybe inside your vehicle, maybe inside your house, there was no notice of it. There was 
Maybe if you looked out the window, saw the leaves blowing in the breeze, maybe you heard a bit of the wind, but otherwise you didn't feel it in your body. You didn't feel the pressure of it as it pushed against you. You didn't feel it trying to veer you off course. You, you were ensconced in safety. You were in this lovely, secure environment. And we enjoy those sorts of environments as God's covenant people. In our homes, in our families, where God is central, where Christ is king, where mom and dad make it a purpose and a plan to live for the Lord, then in that environment, children are raised in a place of security. In our covenant community, our broader community, as we support and encourage each other as friends, as fellow believers, as we provide the help that we need and the encouragement we need when we face challenges of various kind, we are given a bit of respite. We're given a bit of protection against the storms that rage all around us. But there are moments in our lives when we are required to go outside. We're inside of this nice, safe covenant community. We're inside of our nice, safe families, but maybe it's a new job opportunity in a business not run by Christians, not identified as a Christian business, a a big bureaucracy or a big corporation, and suddenly we find ourselves in that storm. Maybe we go from the Christian school, but now we go to the public university, the public college. We find ourselves in that storm. We find ourselves at times being exposed to the challenges and the threats of this fallen world, and and sometimes because we're not prepared for it, we're surprised by it. Suddenly we find ourselves being asked questions by coworkers that we have a hard time answering. Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why do you think the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Why do you think that this is right and that is wrong? These sorts of things. We hear professors at university or at college saying things that all of a sudden begin to sound compelling even though they contradict everything we've heard as we've been raised in the faith. And we find ourselves even at those times struggling. We begin to doubt. We begin to wonder. We begin to have this bit of crisis of faith. Maybe maybe it's true. Maybe we only believed what we believed because we lived in this safe, secure community. Mom and dad told us to go to church. That's why you go to church. Mom and dad told us the Bible is the inspired word of God. That's why we believe it is. And maybe mom and dad were wrong. How do we know that they were right? How We begin to struggle. We begin to find ourselves facing the serious and strong temptations of our world, of, our, of the devil rather, and of our own flesh. And part of that is because in the safety and security of our strong covenant communities, we fail to do the hard work that security ought to provide. We took the security we were given in our homes, in our churches, and in our community for granted. We we thought, well, I'm safe. I don't need to, to borrow the parable of the wise builder, I don't need to dig deep down to lay a foundation of solid faith. I I didn't really need to ask tough questions in catechism. I didn't need to challenge myself to do Bible study. I didn't need to learn because all of my friends, all of my family, everybody is drifting in the same direction, so I just drift with them. We take the blessing of God's care for us for granted, and we don't do the tough work, the demanding work of strengthening our commitment to Christ so that when the storms come, and they inevitably come, we could stand fast. That's something we need to heed and understand as a church community, even as we think about what the catechism says, what Jesus teaches us in the final petition of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are to be reminded in this that even though we may now in this day and in this season be secure and enjoying the peace and prosperity of God's faithfulness towards His covenant community, today is the day to dig deep and to lay a foundation that is solid and to do so in light of what it is that we're taught in this petition. A petition that reminds us that we are profoundly frail. For the Catechism teaches us to confess that we are so weak that we cannot stand on our own, even for a moment. This is first of all, of course, a 
reference to our enemy's great power and persistence. On a normal sunny day, we can walk and work and enjoy life. But we've seen hurricanes lately down in Florida. We've seen those terrifying wind speeds and the power of those hurricanes. It doesn't matter how strong you are, you're not going to withstand such force. It's simply too strong. And I think we prefer understanding the catechism's words here in that way. We prefer to understand that it is the enemy's strength that is the real issue. Did we sometimes say, in fact, maybe in this past week we've been noting this, that the devil, the enemies of the church, want to cast down the leaders. We've heard the stories of pastors unfaithful to their spouses. We hear the stories of leaders within our own community fallen into great sin. And we remind ourselves that, you know, the devil, the world, they really want to attack leaders. And when we say that it sounds good, it sounds pious, and it is on some level true. And it avoids the truth of this confession and it leaves us a measure of dignity. Because the truth is, if that's what we think, that the problem we have is the ferocity of our enemies, which, as we'll see, they are ferocious. We'll get there. But if we think that's the real problem, then then it's not our weakness that's the real issue. It's not that we're inherently weak. It's not that we're always frail. It's just that when the battle is engaged, our enemies have better weapons. They're stronger. They're too unrelenting. You know, on my own, I could stand fast against the temptations of this world. It's just not when the enemy turns his attention to me. That's the problem. Left alone, I would serve God faithfully. But it's only when temptation trips me up because it's so powerful that I fall. If that's the case, then really our frailty is not the issue. Indeed, then we can console ourselves and tell ourselves that if we stay away from our enemies, we'll be safe. Then we can tell ourselves to stay safe within the covenant community, to stay safe technologically, to stay stay safe in terms of our choices of people to associate with or places to go. As long as we steer clear of those places where we're tempted, as long as we don't scroll to those sites that cause us to trip up, as long as we don't participate in those activities that cause us to fall, we'll be okay. That's not what the catechism's answer allows us to do, people of God. It doesn't give us that kind of a perspective. It says we are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment, comma, and our sworn enemies, the devil and the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. If we want to retain some pride, we're going to need to change the word and to the word because. That is, we can't stand on our own because our enemies are too big, too powerful. Not that we're too weak. But the authors put and in there. As in, and, here's another reason why you can't stand. The first reason is you're too weak. The second reason is that your enemies are too strong. You are too weak. Even you who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are too weak to stand for even a moment. And we need to stand in that confession for a moment and let it slay our pride. Because people of God, the greatest threat that we face as we deal with temptations and struggles, as we are reminded of the fall of others and are grieved by them, Let this be the confession we make. My biggest problem is my pride. I think I'm better. I think I'm strong enough. We don't mind admitting that our enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he will devour, but to acknowledge that I can't stand for even a moment is too humbling, too close to the bone, too too oppressive to my pride. And yet this has always been the case. Consider the days before man's fall into sin and ask, would man in the Garden of Eden had to pray this petition? 
At first, we might think not. After all, man was not a sinner who needed to resist unwelcome thoughts, unbidden desires. There was no rebelliousness in his spirit or anywhere in the glorious creation of God. There was no temptations that existed within or without man in the Garden of Eden. Well, of course, there was one. But man didn't know about that one yet, right? He didn't know about the serpent and his temptation. Well, he didn't know about it specifically, but he did know that there was an enemy out there. In Genesis 2.15, the Lord says to man, you are to tend and keep, you are to work and keep the garden. Keep is a word of protection. You are to guard it, watch over it, protect it from an enemy. The implication being there is someone who threatens it. God warned man, there is someone who's threatening you. There is someone out there who wants to draw you into sin. He knew he had to remain faithful to the Lord, thus the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He knew that he had to devote himself to living only for Jesus, that he had consciously and purposefully had to serve his God. And maybe most importantly, he knew that he was made from the dust of the earth. He knew that he wasn't permanent. He knew that he was temporary. He knew that he was frail, that he was feeble as dust. That's why the tree of life was there, because it was a promise that permanence was coming. Permanence was coming when man fulfilled the probationary command. And indeed, the rest of Scripture bears this out. Psalm 103, verse 14 and 15 reminds us that God knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. We forget that we are dust. God remembers. Psalm 90, verse 3 says, You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. We are not yet permanent. We are still mortal. And so man, even in the beginning, could have known, should have known, that he was not so solid, he was not so secure, not so strong, that he could do battle with his enemy apart from a total reliance upon his creating God who had given him strength to fight the good fight. And that's what makes his rebellion against God so very profoundly foolish. Man was utterly and totally dependent for every heartbeat upon God to preserve and protect him and yet refused to believe it and instead chose to accept rebellion against God as the way to go. And that's why, heading out into sin, man found out that we are dust and to dust we will return. Thus, there is a real way in which this aspect of our petition has always needed to be on the lips of God's hearts and God's, or the hearts of God's people and on the lips of God's people. Not first of all because of our enemy, but because, first of all, we are a weak and frail people who need God to sustain us every moment of every day. That has been true from the beginning, and that will be true to the very end of time. And we as God's people need to allow that to slay our pride and to remind us that the problem in life, the greatest problem in life, is not the ferocity of the devil, not the wickedness of the world, but is ultimately my own Failure to acknowledge my need of God's grace. We see this failure to appreciate our dependence upon God in every moment of every day, daily within our community. We see young men driving their trucks too carelessly, taking too many unnecessary risks, who literally place their life in danger for the thrill of proving their invincibility. We see this in the way that some in our community are more than willing to ingest or consume that which does the body great harm. You will hear and you will understand when someone in our congregation is addicted to drugs or is addicted to drink that the consistory says pray for this member for their sinning against the sixth commandment. That is, they are destroying themselves. They are playing fast and loose with their own life. They are scattering the dust of their existence. We do the same in our often too casual relationship with gambling. Our too easy scrolling on our phones through pornography. Our too casual 
approach to anger and frustration in all of those ways in which we, as God's people, might say to ourselves, but I can quit any time. We, heed to, we fail, rather, to heed the warning of Proverbs 6, verse 7, which asks, can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? When we act in these ways, we are either trying to deny the truth that God revealed about our dependence upon Him, that we need Him, and our existence is totally dependent upon His favor, or we don't realize how weak we are. We actually think we're invincible. But we can see this failure expressed in more subtle ways, too. Pride is generally speaking a denial of this truth, a self-confidence and self-reliance upon our own abilities that says to God even at times, I promise I won't do it again as though we have enough strength in ourselves to fulfill that petition. Our pride looks at those around us who have fallen and says, I'm glad I'm not him. Instead of saying there, but for the grace of God go I. We look at those who fall into grievous sin and we say, well, I'd never do, I can't imagine, why would he ever do such a thing? If you don't know the answer to that, you don't know your own depravity, you don't know your own need. Spiritual carelessness is another way in which we deny this truth. A less than dependent prayer life, a less than devoted devotional life, a less than strong commitment to worship. I don't need these spiritual exercises because I can handle the challenges of life on my own. Indeed, a failure to consider this fundamental challenge to life is no less a sign of our refusal to accept this truth. Surely an answer to the question of our own demise is a priority that all men should have. I'm going to die, and when I die, I'm going to have to stand before God, and then what? Do we not see the vital importance of being right with God, with being in a place where the Lord Jesus would receive us and say, well done, good and faithful servant, not in a place where Jesus would say, I never knew you away from me. In these and other ways, we are challenged to see the humbling truth of our own frailty and learn to put to death our pride. Learn to say, it is me, O Lord, who stands in the need of your grace. I know that we struggle with saying that. We struggle with admitting weakness on our own, let alone, let alone expressing our frailty by asking others, please pray for me. Help me to overcome this. Cry out to God on my behalf, for I am weak and I need the help of God and His people. Instead, we in this community, where we deal with pride and live in the strength of our own success, fool ourselves into believing that we can prove our worth and we can fight the fight and overcome all on our own. But we are too weak for that. And our enemy is just too strong. Oh yes, our enemy is strong. It is true that our pride is the first thing we need to slay. But then we also need to take a healthy view of the enemies that we stand against. Our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh. They never stop attacking us, says the catechism. There are a few words in that confession that deserve our attention. Language like sworn enemies. These are not enemies interested in peace talks, in ever letting bygones be bygones. Too often, that is exactly how the church has approached its relationship with the world. Okay, let's compromise. We'll give you a bit. We'll change our singing style. We'll change our worship style. We'll change our priorities. We'll change our principles. We'll give in to the social moral issues, the social justice issues, if you allow us to at least acknowledge Jesus Christ is King. The church has sought to find some detente, some kind of an agreement with the enemy, some kind of mutual existence agreement. But these are sworn enemies. These enemies have committed every moment of their existence to the destruction of God's people. There is no bartering with them. There is no agreeing or coming to some kind of agreement with them. There is only our death in their eyes. And they are serious enemies. They're not just sworn enemies. They're serious enemies. They're not enemies that live on the other side of the world that we have to keep in check by a mighty navy or a great armed forces but don't have to worry about every day of our lives. No, they are enemies that are with us every moment of every day. It is the devil who wars against us, the great dragon who commands a host of angels, of demons, to war against us. 
who is cruel and relentless in his pursuit of God's people, who whispers into our souls and knows how to trip us up with just a look. The world, not as a physical entity now, but in the sense of our culture and of our society, expressing itself in politics and education, philosophy, economics, etc., etc. Everywhere and every day we live inside the camp of an enemy that hates us. And worst of all, we are our own worst enemy, for our own flesh wars against us. Not our literal flesh, of course, as though the problem with our humanities is our bodies. We're not Gnostic. No, flesh here is that aspect of our existence that is in Adam, that aspect that has been tainted by sin, our sinful emotions, desires, thoughts, impulses, those things that come, un, come up in our hearts and minds naturally that you don't even have to try to do, those things that we see our two-year-olds express without ever being taught. Indeed, thus by em- being embraced by an enemy we love quite a bit, which is ourselves, We live in a camp of our enemies, which is the world, that is ruled by a cruel and heartless spiritual captain who is the devil and whom we cannot overcome with weapons of war or with tricks and tips that hack the system. And these enemies never stop attacking. Something we tend to forget. We we tend to forget that we have to fight every day that there is no season when they say we'll give respite. This week, this day, in every respect, even right now, our own flesh is warring against us in this service of worship. Do not listen to this message. Do not hear of the, the power of God's saving grace. Do not rest in His mercy because then you will fight the good fight of the faith. So, Turn your mind to other things. Scroll through your phone for a minute. Think about what you're going to do this week, but do not in this moment experience the power of God. That is the enemy we face. An enemy that is unrelenting and that presses against us with a powerful pressure. And again, the first temptation we have is to over-evaluate our ability to resist these things. The devil comes as an angel of light. He schemes, his schemes and temptations are at times to our hearts and minds the best thing. We hear things like love is love. We hear that weed is just like coffee. We hear that the church is full of hypocrites. And it sounds reasonable. It sounds true. It sounds compelling. Indeed, doesn't the world hold out to us such succulent blessings? Look at how the world seems to do fine with, without having to go to church, without having to be warned, without all of these spiritual fears and frets. They seem to be living life well. They seem successful. Nobody's scaring them with the devil and hell. Surely we could too live happily if we lost all these threats. And truth be told, our flesh cannot always be wrong, can it? I mean, when I feel angry, it's probably because I have a right to be angry. When I feel hurt, it's probably because I am hurt. When I desire something, it must be okay for me to desire. If I lust contrary to God's will, it must be healthy. Surely my own flesh, my own desires, my own instincts can't be wrong. And the point of this is not to suggest or in any way imply that if we can identify all the ways in which our enemies war against us, we can make sure our defenses are sufficient and secure. No part of this message is do better and be better. The point of this word in our confession is to so fill our vision with the enormity of the opposition we face that we cry out to the only one who can deliver us. Indeed, too often we don't do that. We believe our programs and practices will pursue and provide blessing for us apart from a surrender to Christ. I mean, are we as aware of the endless pursuit of our enemies as we ought to be? Do we think that our world is a friend to grace? If we know it's not, why does it have such a grip on our thoughts, on our priorities, on our practices? Think of Paul's words in Ephesians 6 where he reminds us to put on the full armor of God. Is that a habit that you've developed? Is that something that you take seriously? Do each day you remind yourself of who you are in Jesus Christ and how you've been redeemed by the power of the Word and how you are to make war in the protection and provision of His grace? Think about it in terms of your parenting. 
How confident are you in your rules and regulations as a parent? Do you think that you have built high enough walls that'll keep the dragon out? Do you think that your systems will secure your children? What about those calls to put to death those aspects of our life that drive us away from the Lord? How often do we remind ourselves, no, that is wicked, I am killing that. How often do we see the weeds of our hearts and rip them out? Do we hate them or do we just find them an inconvenience? Do we justify them and say, well, you got to love me for who am I? If you can't love me at my worst, you can't love me at my best. What about our priorities? What is the point of our existence? What is the point of our homes? What is the point of our businesses? What about life itself? Do we see life through the lens of our culture or do we see life as the Lord defines it? In so many ways, we ought to acknowledge and recognize that the enemy has gotten behind our lines. That they have managed to captivate and capture our hearts far too often and far too quickly. The world doesn't understand this about the church because they think the church is a way to teach people how to do the right thing so that they can live the right life which is sometimes how we approach the church as well. We give them that impression, suggesting that we're secure because of our walls, because of our principles, because of our practices. We come to church because it makes our lives better, because it makes our marriages better, because it makes our businesses better, because it makes us better. We get advice on how to avoid the problems of life. We are given the moral strength to do the right thing. That's why when you go to almost every mainline evangelical church today, that's all you're going to hear. You're going to hear, do better, be better, and here's how. But the truth is far more humbling and far more devastating. Your enemy is just too terrifying. And you can't stand for a single moment. They've already got behind the lines. They're already inside the camp. They're already sitting at your dinner table eating your meal. So completely victorious do they seem. Which is why the catechism teaches us to pray. And so, Lord, make us strong. Make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we win the complete victory. If we see that we are our worst enemies, that we are the greatest threat to our own security, if we see that our enemies are far more than we can ever hope to overcome, then there is only one place left for us to turn, and that is to the Lord, to Jesus Christ, the great champion, the commander of the Lord's armies, the great victor who in his sovereign grace and mercy makes us to be more than conquerors. There's a lot of theology in this last paragraph that's worth reflecting on. It's a paragraph that might well be something we want to memorize, something that we have upon our lips daily, that that we remind ourselves endlessly, Lord, help me. Lord, make us strong by Your Spirit. Our looking to the Lord for the provision of His Spirit in order to preserve us and cause us to persevere is the first step in acknowledging our frailty and our enemy's ferocity. Now you might say, wait a second, I thought we'd already been given the Holy Spirit. Why do we have to pray for the Holy Spirit some more here? I thought we were preserved by God. Why do we need to pray for perseverance? Or why do we need to pray for uh, our strength? Can we be defeated in this spiritual fight? That seems to be the implication of this teaching. I thought we were once saved, always saved. And the truth is, unfortunately, most of those questions come to us when we approach our spiritual lives, our spiritual warfare, in a more mechanical way than in a spiritual way. Sometimes we treat salvation as just a train ride. As long as you got your ticket and you find your seat, then all you need to do is sit back and relax. You're going to arrive at the right station. And we can so objectify the blessings of salvation that there is no subject of work that needs to be done by us. We don't ever need to talk about those sorts of things because we're so fully saved. Little wonder the Israelites complained on their journey to the promised land. Little wonder the Israelites didn't heed the warnings of the prophets. 
didn't trust in Jesus. We are members of the covenant people. We have Abraham as our father. It is all objectively true. And Jesus says, your father is the devil. The testimony of Scripture makes clear that God's people are called to respond to the revelation of their God with joy and with total surrender and dependence. That was true already in the Garden of Eden. Man needed to say, we will serve the Lord and rest in Him only. It was true in the promised land. Israel needed to fight against the enemies and to trust only their God. This was true in the early days of the church in the New Testament era where the people needed to fight against the culture around them and rest in Jesus Christ. It remains true today. We need to fight the good fight of the faith. We need to each day, resting in what God has done in Jesus Christ, take up the weapons he has provided that we might fight. For our God is not a concierge or conductor. He is our Father who loves to fellowship with his children, with children who acknowledge that they love him and depend upon him. What parent doesn't love it when a child comes and says, I need some help. Can you help out, Mom? Can you help out, Dad? Our God delights to care for those who find refuge in him. Like the mother hen who covers them with her pinions, our God secures us with his wings. And when we look forward, when we look up, when we look to what Jesus Christ has done for us, then we rest in his sovereign plan for our lives and long for that future when we will enter into the eternity, into the freedom of this fight, when we will put down our weapons and will fellowship with God's people on an earth where no sinner will ever be found. It's not, the, 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 it's not merely, rather, the activities of this life that are at issue here. It is our eternal lives that, is, that are at issue. And the Lord encourages us to take up the weapons of war to fight precisely because we have a future with Him. And that future comes only to those who fight. Are we convinced that the only security we have against the enemy that we face is indeed this grace and goodness of God the working of His Holy Spirit in our lives and His Son-saving power? Do we know that He has delivered us not only from the shame and guilt of sin, and we can thank the Lord for that, but He's delivered us from its power by His Spirit's presence too? You, You need only keep in step with the Spirit. It is not your spirituality, it is not your ability that frees you. It is His power within you that you embrace and express in gratitude for what God has done. Indeed, you know that He is able to give you the victory over all your enemies, yes, even over your own flesh. Indeed, that He has already won those battles by His death on the cross. That we have strength to overcome, not in ourselves, but in the crucified Jesus, in the One who has delivered us by His death. And are we convinced that the Father has for our, our lives the best way, the safe way, the eternally secure way that we want to walk only in it. If we are convinced of these things, then surely we will rest daily and persistently in the grace of God. Then every day will be for us an opportunity to again live out of the grace that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. That will mean that we will rejoice in the opportunity to feast on the means of grace. Because we will say, I need that strength. I need that encouragement. I need that bread and wine of the Lord's Supper because I need help. Then we will find ourselves rejoicing in the opportunity to pray. We will begin each day, Lord, guard us, guide us, keep us. Because we know that He is the one who can and does do those things. Then we will be opening His Word together in order to know how it is that we are to navigate the path of life as the world's pressure comes against us. We will ask ourselves not what is the most effective, what is not the most uh, practical, but what is indeed the, the thing that glorifies the Lord most. Then we will lift our eyes heavenward to Jesus Christ and we will rest in His grace towards us. Our enemies love to prevent us from doing that. They want to keep our eyes more horizontal and less vertical. They want to keep our eyes more on the present than on the future. They want to tell us that what happens today doesn't impact tomorrow. And too often, in terms of the choices we make and the actions we take, this seems to be what we think. 
Enjoy yourself now because you won't have to worry about consequences tomorrow. But we discover, unfortunately, too late sometimes, that what we do does catch up with us tomorrow. And we can do the same thing spiritually. We can think that we've punched our ticket for heaven so it doesn't matter how we live on this earth. That's how our enemies tempt us to live. But it matters a great deal. The Scripture makes this clear. But we needn't doubt the goodness or the power of God to protect and preserve us. This isn't to say, so you need to be more spiritual, you need to be more strong, you need to be more devoted. It just means you need to be more dependent, more humble, more acknowledging Jesus Christ's sufficiency and the Spirit's power. The fiercest storms cannot harm those who find cover under His wings. Even the last enemy, the greatest enemy, death, cannot penetrate that safe haven. And therefore, each of us ought to every day live consciously depending upon Jesus for our help and strength. We ought to teach our loved ones what it means to depend upon our Heavenly Father for His preserving grace. And we ought to be calling those who are straying outside of the security of our faith to find their ways in the world that the safest place for them is under the cover of His wings. To call them back to what it is that the Lord has given to them from the beginning. One of the blessings of a strong covenant community. And we live in a very strong covenant community. We may not even appreciate just how profoundly strong we are. One of the blessings of it is that we're just carried along by the ethos and character and culture of our friends, of our schools, of our churches, of our families. Everybody we know loves and serves the Lord, and so we all just walk together. And that is a remarkable blessing. It really is. We are carried in the way of eternal life. What a privilege that is. But it's also a challenge because too easily we can float along, not owning our call to fight, not consciously and purposely striving to battle in this world. And if we're not, utterly dependent upon Jesus Christ, if we don't see how much we need Him each and every day, and we're like the weak in the herd of those great animals on the Serengeti that the lions watch and wait for the one that's behind. We need to fight. We need to resist sin. We need to put sin to death. We need to dig up those weeds before they take over our garden. We need to nourish and sustain the good things that the Lord, by His Word, plants and by His Spirit enables us to cultivate in, his li- in our lives. We need to say, Lord, help me. We need to say, Lord, I will follow You. We need to answer the call of our Savior when He says, take up your cross and follow me. Let's ask the Lord for help in that in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do pray that You would help us to heed the